I don't know anymore. And this started as a show for women starring women. At the very least, we should be elevating the way women are perceived in society. And you're all my period. You're all fired. We often hear that representation in media matters, particularly for women and girls, that it is important that we see ourselves in the media, be it either in a realistic fashion or as role models for the younger generations. But despite calls for more and more female protagonists, female-led movies and television shows are seemingly performing worse and worse, both critically and financially, at the box office, perhaps exemplified no better than the failure of the girl-powered Marvels, which lost about a half a billion dollars and claimed the title of the worst performing film in over a decade of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But of course, the Marvels is not alone, as Disney's Wish also flopped, despite being what otherwise should be the company's bread and butter, an ostensibly animated princess movie, but even that couldn't rouse families to go see it. The live-action remake of The Little Mermaid, an adaptation of one of the studio's most beloved films from the Disney Renaissance, struggled to break even. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, which focused not on the aged eponymous Indy, but instead on his sassy female replacement, as well as Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, that similarly shifted focus from Scott Lang to his activist daughter, were both financial failures. On the small screen, Marvel's She-Hulk, HBO's Velma, Amazon's Rings of Power, and Global TV's Robin Hood, all series that focused on female protagonists, were mocked by audiences. And while She-Hulk managed to eke out mostly middling reviews in total, as did Rings of Power, for some incomprehensible reason, both Velma and Robin Hood sit at a 1 out of 10 on IMDb. There have been more female-led girl power shows and films in the past few years than ever, and yet it seems that everyone, including women, are less interested in watching stories about these strong, independent women that we keep hearing are so important for women to see themselves in the media. But why? Well, the obvious answer is that all of these programs are bad, laughably so, but some will always argue that, well, media is subjective, and while I would disagree, it is true that there are certainly some shows or films that I enjoy that others don't and vice versa. But the argument many critics, activists, actors, and directors have made is that these films and movies are failing not because of their quality, but because of sexism. In a new interview with Variety, Nia DaCosta broke down her superpowered blockbuster being called woke by some moviegoers. Quote, there are pockets where you go because you're like, I'm a super fan. I want to just exist in a space of just adoration, which includes civilized critique. Then there are pockets that are really virulent and violent and racist and sexist and homophobic and all those awful things. Please put out all the buzzwords. Now, of course, these same groups of people have often frequently said that changes to pop culture media to include more strong women and diverse casts and progressive stories are simply not made for the previous core audience of white men, and thus said white men just shouldn't watch them. I do not need a 40-year-old white dude to tell me what didn't work for him about A Wrinkle in Time. It wasn't made for him. Which, well then, regardless of quality, would alone explain the drop in the box office and in the viewership. You told white men not to watch it, so they didn't. To me, though, none of that stands up to scrutiny prima facie because I grew up in the 90s and the 2000s, with shows that I still watch over and over again to this day that featured strong female characters, from Buffy the Vampire Slayer to Stargate SG-1 to The X-Files to Alias to Star Trek Voyager, which I love, despite it not being everyone's cup of nebula-siphoned coffee. There's coffee in that nebula. And yet still stayed on the air for seven seasons with a female driver behind the proverbial wheel of a starship. It doesn't seem to me that audiences, white males or otherwise, have always disliked female-led media. But here on this channel, I don't like to speculate about the objectivity of media analysis, no. Here we like to talk about cold, hard facts. About statistical analysis and data. Data? Look at this. Data. So today, we're going to do just that. We're going to look at the data to answer the question that seems to be plaguing a struggling Hollywood. Why are all of these female-led projects suddenly flopping? Is it because of sexual objectification that still somehow keeps women away from these projects? Is it because men just don't like seeing strong women in their TV shows and movies? Or is it, in fact, 
because the group that first and foremost does not like aggressive, mean, cruel, and often physically unattractive female protagonists in their media is in fact the very group that they are trying to pander to. Women. Today, let's look at the data on how both women and men feel about the roles and appearances of female characters, as well as the actresses who portray them, both in terms of how they say they feel about representation and how they actually feel subconsciously, using data. Not feelings, not speculation, but science. Beginning by examining a common claim made about representation of women in media, that women don't just need to see other women, they need to see themselves, meaning no supermodels, but rather average looking, perhaps overweight, even outright unattractive women in media in order to truly relate to that media. Which we can do not just by asking them, but by examining neurological activation. It's beyond a trope that women aren't fond of gratuitous, sexy displays from their fellow females in film and television, seeing it as sexist and objectifying. I look like a hooker. They're called sex workers, and they're heroes. Thank you for your service. But do women really dislike seeing attractive females who exist purely as eye candy in media because it somehow elicits feelings of personal self-doubt? Do women really prefer seeing strong, independent women in films and television? Are the claims that many make about objectification actually true as it applies to media? While we can, and will, look at plenty of survey data, I think it's best to actually start with some of the strongest evidence that women don't necessarily like the kinds of female representation in the media that they claim to like, which comes from Iacomboni, 2006. Dr. Iacomboni and his colleagues at the UCLA Abrahamson Lovelace Brain Mapping Center used fMRI brain imaging to examine brain activation while watching Super Bowl advertisements. While women said that they disliked the ads that featured the attractive, scantily clad women, their brains showed significantly more activation, indicating identification and empathy with the advertisement when watching the sexualized ads over the more neutral ones, such as the now long tradition of the I'm going to Disney adverts present in the Super Bowl, which have frequently been cited as crowd-pleasing favorites. You and the Pittsburgh Steelers just won the Super Bowl. What are you going to do next? I'm going to Disney World! These results seemingly indicate that what women say they want out of entertainment media is not what they actually enjoy. This is not unique to women, as Iacomboni found that, for example, when asked why they liked this Super Bowl FedEx ad, which features multiple instances of violence against both dinosaurs and people, Next time, use FedEx. Respondents of both sexes said that they liked it because it was funny, yet fMRI data indicated a sharp increase in activation in the amygdala, which processes fear and threat. That is, while participants said that watching the caveman being crushed by the dinosaur was funny, their brains reacted to it as if it was something to be afraid of. Although some cavemen are just built different. Similarly, while women often say they dislike seeing women in skimpy clothing because it is objectifying or sexist, their brains betray the fact that such imagery is simply more neurologically stimulating than non-sexualized advertisements. In short, what people say that they want to watch, because it is perhaps socially or politically in vogue, is not what their brains actually enjoy. This isn't new, either. Women saying that they like things in media that they probably actually don't like has been pervasive for decades, and is a trend that we can examine by looking to a 2003 study from Bonnie Oppenheimer et al. And yes, the first author really is named Bonnie Oppenheimer, so close to Barbenheimer that I can't even have made it up if I had wanted to. Serendipity, I suppose. I'm moving like Oppenheimer. She dropped that ass on me from an egregious angle. They thought I was Stephen Wallace. Anyway, Oppenheimer et al. selected five scenes of five different strong female television characters in order to understand audience perceptions of those women. Students at a public university and at a historically black college were exposed to a scene featuring one of these characters. One scene was of the eponymous Amy from Judging Amy, a female judge who dresses down male attorneys in front of the court after refusing to allow them to approach her bench. Another scene from JAG depicted Major Sarah McKenzie being berated by a witness, but rather than respond verbally, her power is depicted only via visual storytelling, with the camera directly looking down on the witness 
and depicting Mackenzie in her full formal Marine uniform standing tall and proud. A scene from Dr. Becker showed Nurse Margaret giving assertive life advice to a fellow nurse while dressed in her own professional attire, complete with scrubs and stethoscope. In a scene from Touched by an Angel, Tess, the head of the angels, gave firm instructions to the others on how to carry out their missions. Finally, another scene from Judging Amy featured a social worker, Maxine, who informs an unwed mother on proper motherly behavior while still speaking with authority. All of these scenes displayed women in various degrees of social power, some with visual representations of that power, such as a judge's robes, a military uniform, a nurse's scrubs, etc. But not all manifestations of power within these scenes are identical in their femininity nor authoritativeness. Also, the scholars had so many options of female characters from 90s TV shows to choose from, and somehow picked some of the most boring shows possible. Come on, Oppenheimer at all. Where's Sam Carter? Where's Dana Scully? What a letdown. Have you ever pulled out of a simulated bombing run in an F-16 at 8 plus G's? Yes. I'm an Air Force officer just like you are, Colonel. And just because my reproductive organs are on the inside instead of the outside, doesn't mean I can't handle whatever you can handle. If you have any doubt about my qualifications or credentials... I You're a medical doctor. You teach at the academy. You did your undergraduate degree in physics. Einstein's twin paradox, a new interpretation. Dana Scully's senior thesis. Now that's a credential, rewriting Einstein. Anyway, participants were asked to write each of these female characters on how aesthetically pleasing, pleasant, relatable, irritating, funny, likable, sexy, and strong they were. Both men and women viewed all of the characters portrayed as strong, but women viewed them as stronger than did men. There was no difference between the perceived femininity nor masculinity of these characters between male and female participants. All were seen as feminine. Women also reported liking the female characters more so than did men, and viewed them as more nice, although both sexes reported that the characters were fairly nice and fairly likable. Men and women also rated the characters as similarly relatable to each other. Unsurprisingly, men rated the characters as more sexy than did women, but as we can see here, that doesn't appear to have had any effect on whether or not women liked them or viewed them as strong. Neither sex rated the female characters as particularly either funny nor irritating. No! St women aren't funny! And perhaps the latter finding is particularly important because so many of the girl boss characters of 20 years later are seemingly intentionally irritating. So I'm an expert at controlling my anger because I do it infinitely more than you. When female characters aren't obnoxious, however, both men and women can like those characters. And although women may like them more and view them as stronger than do men, as was the case in this particular sample of shows from the 90s when men and women viewed those characters as more feminine than they were masculine, women and men could both find female characters in positions of power to be relatable, likable, and nice, despite also being strong and feminine. It's unlikely that 20 years has drastically changed everything about how people relate to and enjoy media characters inherently. Thus, the problem doesn't seem to lie in men who just hate strong female characters, and that's why box office sales for women-led films and women-led TV shows have been circling the drain. No, men seem perfectly as able to relate to women in positions of power as do women. The problem is that the characters are now more masculine than they are feminine. They're unlikable, they're not nice, and more than anything, they're irritating. And I would argue that the prevalence of those masculine, nasty, annoying women in media also has created an expectation that any woman in media will be similarly vile due to a new expectation from audiences that such a thing is the norm. That didn't seem to be the case in the 90s, as that era featured easily one of the most likable and professional female characters in television history, and with a great set of legs to boot. Of course, I'm referring to David Duchovny in Twin Peaks. But we don't just have to guess. Oh no, friends, we have data. Rock Gonzalez and John Kier 2020 exposed U.S. college students to two short clips from a Danish television drama, Borgen, which centers around the character of Bridget Nyberg, who becomes the first female prime minister of Denmark, something that has gone swimmingly for so many countries in real life. Because the show had such a limited release outside of Denmark, the author selected it as the college students likely would be unfamiliar with it and its characters, nor with Danish politics in general. The clip in question featured Bridget speaking with the male head of a major Danish corporation regarding a proposed government bill that would require a certain percentage of corporate boards to contain women executives. Another benefit of the fact that their American participants didn't speak Danish 
is that the scholars were able to use the exact same scene to increase internal validity by simply changing the subtitles, rather than using entirely different scenes to compare and contrast with one another. As such, in one version, Bridget's speech was more agentic, direct, and assertive, while in the other, Bridget's dialogue was more helpful, agreeable, and less confrontational. After watching the clip, participants were surveyed on how much they liked Bridget, perceived her as competent, viewed her as hostile, identified with her, and to what degree, if any, they found themselves wanting to argue back against the points that Bridget made in her speech. Male participants reported finding Bridget less likable when she used agentic, assertive speech comparatively to when she used agreeable and helpful speech, while women found her equally likable regardless of what type of speech she used. This could be because women were paying closer attention to the body language and tone, which again was identical regardless of the subtitles, but it's hard to say. Young people with an average age of 22 did not differ in their perceptions of Bridget as more hostile when she used the assertive speech over the agreeable speech. However, the older generations did view Bridget as less hostile when she used the communalistic speech. Interestingly, participants in their early 20s actually viewed the compassionate speech as slightly, albeit non-significantly, more hostile than the assertive speech, perhaps perceiving it not as nice, but rather as Bridget being manipulative. Again, this was non-significant, but could also indicate that younger millennials and Zoomers find caring language in female characters to be more hostile than actual aggressive language. Again, perhaps because it comes off as condescending, or at least condescending to them in a way that it does not to older generations. So why aren't young people going to see these female-led films with these more assertive women that they somehow may see as equally, if not even less hostile than more traditionally feminine characters? Well, it's not just hostility either as older participants viewed the more assertive Bridget as actually less competent at her job as PM than did the younger participants. In contrast, younger participants viewed Bridget as significantly less competent when she was compassionate compared to older participants. Could this be a problem in what people say that they want versus what they actually want in their female protagonists? Given the hard data that we now have persistently in terms of box office earnings and viewership of these woman-led girl power shows and films, well, it certainly seems to be the case. And it is certainly unquestionable to say that the depictions of women in media have changed as feminist perspectives have become more mainstream, but perhaps not in the way that the feminists would have hoped, but rather in one that speaks to deeper reaction to stimuli over what women or even male allies say that they want, but not what they actually want. An analysis of articles in video game magazines between 1998 and 2007 from Summers and Miller 2014, for example, found that by late 2007, women were almost never portrayed as damsels or in need of rescue, while at the same time a completely opposite effect emerged, with female characters becoming sexier and wearing more revealing outfits. Of course, this horrible occurrence is why game companies are now pushing to make their female protagonists increasingly less attractive from Fable to Horizon. Yeah, nothing says female inclusion like making them ugly. <laughs> but is there actually any evidence that women like that change? It doesn't seem so from the data. But let's examine how ladies really feel about strong independent women in entertainment to see who actually likes a girl boss. With fewer damsels in distress and more girl bosses that women so frequently say that they like seeing in media, how do women actually feel about strong, independent women in media? The results may surprise you. So for more information, let's look to Taylor and Setters, 2011, who examined perceptions of female characters as both aggressive and attractive on men and women's endorsements of feminine stereotypes in society as normative in a sample of American college students. Participants were exposed to one of four clips, with one featuring an attractive but aggressive female character, another featuring an aggressive but unattractive character, a third featuring a passive attractive character, and the final featuring a passive but unattractive character. The attractive aggressive clip was of Angelina Jolie in Tomb Raider, the unattractive aggressive clip was of Kathy Bates from Primary Colors, although I'm not sure why they didn't go with Misery or Dolores Clyburn, but whatever. The attractive passive clip was of Jolie in The Changeling, and the unattractive, unaggressive clip was of Bates in Fried Green Tomatoes. I do want to make clear that while the point here was to use the same actress in different types of roles, they may not have been the best choices, as Jo Lee plays a heavily victimized, even tortured character in The Changeling, far removed from her role as Laura Croft, 
and not really comparable to the unhappy but not tormented character of Bates in Fried Green Tomatoes, nor Laura Croft comparable to the political leg breaker that Bates plays in Primary Colors, but it's what we've got to work with here. After watching the clips, participants were asked to what degree they saw the characters as good role models for women and also rate the actress's physical appearance on a scale from 1 to 10. Additionally, subjects reacted to a gender role expectancy instrument that asked them what behaviors were important for both men and for women. For example, someone who believes that women should have more traditionally feminine behaviors would be more likely to report that it is important for women to make efforts to form emotional bonds with others in her social network, be emotionally available to her friends, spend time with family and friends, remember kindness and compassion as key aspects of feminine leadership, spend a significant amount of her time helping her classmates understand the course material if she does, and they do not, and be sympathetic and tender while doing community service. In contrast, someone who believes that women should have more traditionally masculine behaviors would be more likely to report that it is important for women to use social networking contacts to get ahead, give her female friends practical over emotional advice, do things on her own without the input of family and friends, abide by the motto, quote, all's fair in love and war, or do anything it takes to climb the ladder in her chosen career. In other words, either promote synergy and well-being within the group, or to be a self-serving parasite. They found that in general, women were less accepting of stereotypically masculine behaviors or traits in female protagonists than were men, while also being more accepting of stereotypically feminine behaviors or traits in female protagonists as well compared to men. Once again, while women may protest that they want to see strong, independent girl bosses who don't need no man publicly, we actually tend to be less accepting of masculine traits in female protagonists than men tend to be. All of that time and effort that the CIA spent on trying to make humans work backwards, and there's absolutely no effect. Looking specifically at the different combinations of traits possessed by female protagonists, both attractiveness and aggression illustrate that participants of both sexes also were most likely to be accepting of feminine gender roles as normative for women when they watched the clip of Angelina Jolie in Tomb Raider, both attractive and aggressive, and were the least accepting of feminine gender roles as normative when they watched the clip of Kathy Bates in Primary Colors, unattractive and aggressive. Feminine gender roles were accepted as normative to the same degree in both actresses when their characters were not aggressive. Similarly, masculine roles for the unaggressive protagonists were less accepted, but did not differ regardless of whether Jolie or Bates was playing the unaggressive role. All masculine traits were seen as less appropriate for female characters by participants in this study, but were seen as the most unacceptable when the character was both unattractive and aggressive, while being the most acceptable, although still lower than the acceptability of feminine traits, when the character was both attractive and aggressive. That is, Subjects believed that it was really only appropriate for a female character to enact traditionally masculine behaviors when that female character was also attractive, and that it was least appropriate for an unattractive female character to enact traditionally masculine behaviors. The female character who was neither attractive nor aggressive was least likely to be reported as a good role model for women, followed by the unattractive and aggressive character, then the attractive but not aggressive, and finally the aggressive and attractive female character was reported by the entire sample as the best role model for women. That all seems a little bit contradictory at first, but remember, both men and women were responding to this section, and men were more accepting of aggressive, assertive women in films than were women. Also, as we've seen, women may say that they think more masculine media representations of women are desirable, despite what's actually going on inside of her brain. In total, though, it seems that you can absolutely sell both sexes on the idea of a woman character who kicks ass and isn't traditionally feminine in terms of her role, but only if she's also hot. Obviously, your Mila Jovovich Alice, your Uma Thurman's Bride, your David Duchovny's Denise Bryson. If a female character is aggressive and unattractive, then both men and women will see masculine traits in women as less acceptable. Why is She-Hulk such a reviled show, even though plenty of women publicly say that they love it? Well, because when anonymized, or when their brain activity is being examined, statistically speaking, they probably don't love it. This character with wonky-looking CGI that robs Tatiana Maslany of much, if not all, of her natural beauty, who is shown repeatedly as being extremely aggressive, often over the most minor of issues, is single, completely obsessed with her job, and the antithesis of nurturing, 
is a perfect storm of everything women actually don't like to see in other women, but also the exact combination of traits that causes viewers of both sexes to be more likely to believe masculine roles are unacceptable for women. That's to say nothing of the seeming cruelty of casting an actress who physically cannot build muscle definition due to a genetic disorder, Jamila Jamil, to play a muscle girl in the same program. Good job as usual with that choice, Disney Marvel. Jamila as a whiny, pampered narcissist in The Good Place? Hey, that was great. Jamila as a power lifter in She-Hulk? That almost comes off as intentionally mean. What's interesting to me, though, is that this study was published in 2011. How does the mouse media empire, which spent 2023 burning money on failed project after failed project, all to serve the message, not have a pittance to spend on actual market research? And by that I mean data and statistics, not feelings and folklore about what you would like to be true, rather than what actually is true. Women are particularly unaccepting of masculine traits in female characters, but both sexes are only accepting of said masculine traits in female characters when she is physically attractive. Brie Larson, who can seemingly only remember what a smile is while being vain, vile, and dismissive of others, should never have been made the face of some push towards more female heroes because she is exactly what encourages both men and women to be less accepting of masculine traits in female characters, a woman who is nowhere near hot enough to be as much of an insufferable, violent, overpowered bent as she is. Look, I'm not saying that Brie Larson is ugly. I'm saying that she's not attractive enough to behave the way that Brie Larson does. I did my stunts because I thought that that's what everyone did. Uh, and then... it Tom, Tom Cruise, I mean? No, I'll be the first me, not the next Tom Cruise. Thank you Ooh. very much. Well. Having Brie be the face of the MCU is like having Shodan be the face of McAfee antivirus software. Except Shodan is hotter. The same applies to Rachel Zegler and any other obnoxious actress in Hollywood. Yeah, you can be aggressive, but you have to be really, really attractive to pull it off. I've plotted it here on this very scientific graph. As you can see, as hotness increases, the amount of bitchy, aggressive, masculine behaviors that audiences will be willing to accept in women also increases. However, and this is mere speculation, I would predict there is an upper limit to this effect. If, hypothetically, we were to increase both Brie Larson's hotness and bitchiness linearly, at some point, no matter how hot she is, the bitchiness beats out the hotness. But again, that's just a theory. The danger zone. This is your redheads, your strippers, anyone named Tiffany. Um, hairdressers. This is hairdressers. Given that audiences were less accepting of women possessing masculine traits after watching a media portrayal of an aggressive but unattractive female character, well, doesn't that just prove the point of all of the activists? that women in film and television are being unfairly judged by appearance, even if largely it's other women doing it? It wouldn't be the first time that men have been punished for women's sins, after all. Now, of course, it seems that pushing aggressive, unattractive women makes everyone more likely to think that women should be feminine and not masculine, totally contradictory to the thing that the activists are trying to push, and thereby shooting themselves in the collective feet and shilling these characters, but maybe, if you just inundate the entire media landscape, then you can change human psychology, right? Well, how's that turning out? So let's look instead at beautiful actresses and how they influence attitudes towards women specifically, since they're the ones that, as we've seen, actually tend to increase the acceptability of masculine traits in women, at least in action films, by looking to a study from Nasser and Ferguson 2020, who screened the first 30 minutes of one of six films to undergraduate students and then surveyed them on their feelings of anxiety, negative attitudes towards women, rape myth acceptance inventory, which includes items such as, quote, if a girl doesn't physically fight back, you can't really say it was and quote, accusations are often used as a way of getting back at guys, end quote, because the latter is totally a myth and not something that happens all the time or anything. But I digress. The movie's chosen depicted either a powerful but non-sexualized female protagonist, for example, Hermione Granger from Harry Potter, or Wichita and Little Rock from Zombieland, a sexualized but non-powerful female protagonist, for example, Michaela Baines from Transformers, or Casey Becker and Sidney Prescott from Scream, or a female protagonist who is both sexualized and powerful, for example, Natasha Romanoff from The Avengers, or Elizabeth Bennet from Pride, Prejudice, and Zombies. Look, don't ask me why they picked these characters from these films, we're just gonna run with it. 
They found that while men tended to have slightly lower attitudes towards female characters than did women across all conditions, both men and women had the most positive attitudes towards women when they had watched a film featuring a sexualized but not powerful female protagonist. There was no significant difference in women's attitudes towards other women when she watched a film where either a sexual or a powerful or a powerful only female character was present. The sexualized characters produced the most positive attitudes towards women from other women. Similar to the general findings of attitudes towards women, men were more likely to agree with rape myths regardless of the film screened. However, both men and women were more accepting of rape myths when the female character was either sexualized or both sexualized and powerful compared to when the character was only powerful, but not sexy. Levels of reported anxiety were similar across the sexes after watching the powerful or powerful and sexy depiction of a female character. However, women expressed far more anxiety and men far less compared to the other two conditions when they watched a movie with a sexualized, not powerful female character. Thus, while both men and women may be more likely to accept some supposed myths regarding sexual assault when they have been exposed to any depiction of a sexy female character, regardless of whether or not she's powerful, at the same time, women tend to have the most positive attitudes towards her own sex when she has watched a clip of a sexualized and not powerful female character. This may go back to the perceived appropriateness of masculine and feminine gender roles in that viewers see stereotypically feminine traits as more appropriate in attractive but not aggressive women and most appropriate in both attractive and aggressive female characters while being less appropriate in unattractive women. Being sexually attractive and feminine is apparently appreciated by women and men alike. The data do not bear out the argument that seeing a sexy female protagonist makes men hate women and women hate themselves. In fact, the opposite is the case. Both sexes have more positive attitudes towards women when they see beautiful women in media. And that really shouldn't be surprising, although modern media analysts would sure like you to think so. Nobody gets into cars after looking at images of the Dacia Sandero or the Reliant Robin. People get into cars by looking at works of mechanical art like the Ford Mustang, the McLaren F1, and the AU Falcon. Oh no. Wow. Wow. You had a family, People Motors. One of the catchphrases that we hear touted so often as it regards female characters in film and television is that women shouldn't just like these characters, but that the characters are necessary so that women can see themselves in media. So do women identify with girl bosses? And if so, are women who identify with particularly aggressive female characters like Captain Marvel or She-Hulk more aggressive in their personal lives? Greenwood 2007 examined women's identification with various action heroines in a sample of 85 college students. Heroine and heroine, completely different books of frogs. Heroine's f***ing worse, mate. I point out the number because the authors surveyed 163 women, and just over half could name a single female action heroine that she considered as a favored character. The most favored female action characters were Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Sydney from Alias, the Bride from Kill Bill, and various members of Charlie's Angels. But that was in 2007 and things have changed in the interim. Although I'm not sure if you were to go to a college campus today and ask 163 women who their favorite female superhero was, that a single would list Captain Marvel, let alone She-Hulk. But who knows, maybe Madam Web will change everything. Subjects were asked how often they watched media with female action heroes, how much they enjoyed these works, how much they wanted to be like their favorite female hero, how much they idealized that character, as well as how physically and emotionally aggressive the participant herself believed that she was, including her frequency of starting fights, gossiping, and losing her temper. So I'm an expert at controlling my anger because I do it infinitely more than you. Identifying with a female action hero was unrelated to actual aggression, intentions to aggress, or to engage in relational aggression, such as gossiping. This was not the case, though, for idealization. Women who idealized aggressive female protagonists were, in fact, more likely to report that she engaged in aggressive behaviors and aggressive intentions towards others. And although idealization was not related to increased reports of relational aggression, relational aggression was related to both aggressive behaviors and aggressive intentions. Women who identified with an aggressive female character were 
pretty normal, but women who idealized an aggressive female character were more likely to be aggressive themselves. Regression analysis, which allows us to understand how variables interact with one another to predict outcomes, found that idealization and identification did not remain statistically significant predictors of emotional aggression when genre affinity was taken into consideration. That is, women who like action content as a genre are not going to be more emotionally aggressive when they watch it, but instead, it seems that it's women who probably don't generally care so much for such fiction who may have more emotionally aggressive tendencies. Gee, I wonder who likes She-Hulk or the Marvels? I mean, besides no one. But of the few people who do, the women who identify as and idealize those characters and would also be more aggressive because of that idealization are women who actually typically do not care for superhero or action media. We certainly see that kind of aggression online with women who demand more of this stuff that, probably deep down, they don't even really like. Actual aggressive behavior was predicted by idealization of an aggressive heroine, but only at the first step before adding identification into the model fit. Thus, idealizing a violent female character does appear to be related to actual aggressive behavior or intentions to be aggressive in female viewers, and it seems that for emotional aggression, such as gossiping or just being rude, it's probably mostly women who don't typically enjoy action media who tend to be more emotionally aggressive in relationship to watching that media. Is it really any surprise, though, that women who idealize Brie Larson are more likely to be personally aggressive, both emotionally and even physically? Wow, wow what a shock. Here's a proposition for you. <clears throat> You're gonna give me your jacket, your helmet, and your motorcycle, and in return, <clears throat> I'm gonna let you keep your hand. <clears throat> While we've looked, so far, exclusively at masculine traits in female characters, what about the opposite, feminine traits in male characters, and the audience's perceptions of those traits? If women seem to be perfectly fine, if not even preferential towards sexy feminine women in media, despite the constant virtue signaling that said representations hurt women's rights somehow, how does either sex feel about effeminate male characters? Enough about women's rights! It's time to talk about women's wrongs! Sanborn, Overby, and Poshita, 2020, examine the asymmetry between male characters with feminine traits and female characters with masculine traits across three studies. U.S. adult participants were asked to rate how acceptable a series of characteristics were for either a man or a woman to possess, including occupations, with masculine being, for example, a lawyer or an engineer, and feminine being, for example, a dietitian or a nurse, activities with the masculine being, for example, shooting pool or fixing motorcycles, and feminine being, for example, doing gymnastics or baking cookies. Traits with the masculine ones being being a leader or strong, and the feminine traits being affectionate or well-mannered. And appearance characteristics, with the masculine being wearing swim trunks or muscle shirts, and the feminine being wearing perfume or having long nails. They found that there was significantly more intolerance of males possessing feminine traits than there was an intolerance of females possessing masculine traits, and that this was the case across both sexes of participants. On a basic level then, it seems that even if women don't really like girl boss bitches, far more people are turned off by male characters who engage in feminine activities or possess feminine traits than the reverse. In their second study, US adult respondents were instead asked to rate how typical the aforementioned characteristics were for a homosexual or for a heterosexual male or a heterosexual or homosexual female, and were also queried on their personal sexual orientation. Feminine characteristics in males were seen as more typical of homosexuality than were masculine characteristics in women. For feminine characteristics in men, perceived homosexuality scores were highest in the appearance domain, followed by occupations, activities, and then traits. Thus, a man who is well-mannered is less likely to be seen as a homosexual compared to a man who bakes cookies or who works as a nurse. But a guy who wears makeup or nail polish? Those tend to be the characteristics that people most commonly associate with homosexuality in men. Gay! The perception that appearance was a uniquely potent predictor of homosexuality in men was particularly pronounced in female participants. For masculine items, perceived homosexuality scores for women were also highest concerning appearance, followed by activities, occupation, and finally traits. Thus, for both sexes, how one dresses is more of a signifier of sexuality to others than our individual activities, occupations, or traits. 
A final study sought to assess the relationship between the intolerance of certain characteristics with the perceived homosexuality of those characteristics by comparing data from the first two studies. They found that there was a positive relationship between how homosexual a particular item was seen as being when possessed by gender atypical targets and how intolerant participants were of gender role violations for that item. That is, the more that a subject reported, say, being a male nurse was indicative of homosexuality, the more likely that same subject is to also view being a male nurse as socially unacceptable. Again, all of these findings were predominantly in men with feminine characteristics, not so much for women with masculine characteristics. I point this all out because the average person doesn't find women working as lawyers or doctors, shooting pool or fixing bikes, being leaders or wearing boxers as generally violative of social norms nor evidence of her sexuality. In contrast for men, people tend to view feminine characteristics as both unacceptable in them, but also as evidence of a man's sexuality. The reason people, including women, don't like masculine female characters like Captain Marvel, Batwoman, She-Hulk, Guy Ladriel, Velma, etc. isn't because it's seen as socially unacceptable for women to have masculine characteristics. People largely don't seem to care if a woman's a badass. They don't like these characters because they're masculine. They're just horrible, aggressive, but not actually strong people. They're terrible people. If I were a rich white dude, I'd kill everybody just to get away with it. Ellen Ripley in Alien is a strong female character that is beloved by fans because she uses her wit, not pure physical strength, at least at every moment, to survive. And as many have noted, there is some weird, serious female body horror in Alien that plays along with Ripley as being the female protagonist. When I think of my favorite female characters, I think of women like Captain Doctor Samantha Carter from Stargate SG-1, or Dana Scully from The X-Files. Both are women in traditionally male fields, the Air Force and the FBI, respectively. Both have a lot of traditionally masculine traits, both being analytical and scientifically minded. They're both doctors, but they're both also beautiful and feminine, with episodes from both shows depicting their nurturing and empathetic feminine aspects. While perhaps it's my love of characters like Scully or Carter, which is why I'm more accepting of traditional gender roles based on the data that we've looked at today, those are two characters from the 90s, and I can't recall anyone having a problem with them the way they do with Captain Marvel, Rey Skywalker, or She-Hulk. The data are pretty clear here. People don't mind a woman with some masculine characteristics. They just don't like nasty, rude, mean, cruel bitches. Just how endemic were negative or stereotypical portrayals of women in film before the modern MCU, though? Did it really all break new ground? It broke new ground! Is all of this actually revolutionary, or is the flopping at the box office not so much because of the presence of powerful independent women in media, but rather because of the overall quality of the writing of these films and television programs? A thematic analysis of 165 female characters from 137 films conducted by Ezzedine, 2015, examined the portrayals of career women, particularly in careers that are typically male-dominated, such as business or science and media. Characteristics of these female characters were broken down into those concerned with her professional life and her personal life, and fell into both personality traits and relationships with other characters. She found that, contrary to her expectations, women were not portrayed commonly as bimbos or sexual objects, but rather as competent and ambitious, although often also obsessed with their careers. Instead, these working women were portrayed as so competent that rather than being depicted as sexy but stupid, they instead were most commonly portrayed as bitches, being cruel, callous, and again obsessed with their work, but not as sex objects. Ezzedine admits, albeit seemingly unpleased in doing so, that she could find few examples of women being tokenized in these positions, but did find plenty of examples of hostile female bosses and female peers. For some reason, at least according to people like Ezzedine, it's a problem when female characters are depicted as engaging in stereotyping, taunting, or backstabbing others because that's sexist? Yeah, depicting people as human beings with flaws is apparently an issue when those human beings have two X chromosomes. Perhaps explained because these characters are being written by people with three or four of them. No wonder they can't help but write Mary Sue's. Here's a scholar right here. The people who lead these social movements and provide them with some of the faux sense of legitimacy that they give to themselves, telling us that any negative traits in a female character is problematic. Gee, where do you think they got the ideas from? 
As it again breaks down the archetypes of female characters' personal lives outside of career in these films down to four types. Bimbo, for example, Legally Blonde, the ultra-feminine woman, for example, New in Town, which I've never seen, so I'll just assume it's this. Pushed me, and he said, excuse me, I am homeless, I am gay, I have AIDS, I'm new in town. <laughs> You're gonna close with new in town? The androgynous woman, for example, the born supremacy, and the tomboy prototypes, for example, Miss Congeniality. But as already stated, the portrayal of a female protagonist as a bimbo was relatively uncommon, as was the tomboy aesthetic, with the most common traits of all of these women characters being mental instability, loneliness, and promiscuity. Many of the characters were portrayed as nasty and mean, again indicating that this isn't even a modern trope, but rather a quite old one that you could date back to Taming of the Shrew, that is now described as positive when displayed in modern female protagonists, but which back in just 2015, feminist academics were complaining about in their own writings. As it concerned other characters, a predominant theme that Ezzedine identified was that these career women were rarely married or in a committed romantic relationship, Again, a trend that is not new, is quite common and has been so for decades in representations of successful career women in films and television. Typically, the problems with relationships that these women faced were concerned not with her personality traits or behaviors, but instead with her taste in men, unable to find Mr. Right and, relatedly, struggling to have a family. For the few women who were mothers and had careers, they were often portrayed as inept and unable to balance the two roles. In total, though, I found this analysis interesting because it displays that none of this is new, and also how the opinions that feminists have on certain traits have fluctuated over time. In 2015, it was seen as problematic for women to be portrayed as bitchy, but in the current year, that's supposed to be, if ineffectually, a selling point for female viewers, even if, again, we don't really like it in practice. So what about that female empowerment messaging that companies like Disney claim to be promoting, even if it costs them millions of dollars? Surely, even if women don't particularly like these individual characters, seeing an empowered girl boss on the big or small screen must positively affect women's personal sense of empowerment, right? Well, Drake 2017 examined how women felt about femvertising, that is, ads with explicit girl power messages, by exposing female participants to one of four 30-second long advertisements. Always Like a Girl campaign, Brawny's Strength Has No Gender campaign, or two ads from the same brands that made no mention of female empowerment. Subjects were then surveyed on their opinions on the portrayal of women in the ads, perceptions of the company's image, intention to purchase the product, and emotional connection to the brand. Women reported higher opinions towards the empowering ads compared to the control ads, as well as higher opinions towards the brand as a whole. Women also reported being more likely to purchase Always or Brawny products, that the brand fit her self-image, and that she saw the brand like a personal companion when she watched the Girl Power advertisement. Further, women said that the femvertisements more accurately portrayed women, suggested that women make more important decisions, and show women how they really are, as well as said that the ads were less suggestive that women can't do important things, that women's place was in the home, or to find the portrayal of women as offensive. Participants also agreed that the empowerment ads were in fact more empowering, Somewhat curiously, however, neither ad type produced a significant effect in women's belief that the portrayal of women in advertising was changing for the better, which I find particularly interesting because that result seems to imply that even when companies put out messaging that very explicitly promotes women's empowerment, women don't seem to believe that any progress in their empowerment is being made. Disregard that, Frank, it's a bunch of liberal bullshit. That would imply that no amount of girl power messaging, no matter how over the top and overt, actually makes women think that progress in women's empowerment is happening. Once again, it seems that while women may say that they like these messages, they don't see them as actually being indicative of any positive change in society, but rather, perhaps, as little more than pandering. Because it is pandering. Potentially relatedly, respondents were also more likely to report that she was more sensitive to the portrayal of women than she used to be in response to the empowerment ad, which could indicate that all these ads do is make women pay more attention to the fact that the media is about women's empowerment, even though it doesn't make them think that women are actually being empowered. It also doesn't seem as if it's just more representation of strong women in the workforce that has become increasingly common. It also seems, specifically, that women have become portrayed as more and more violent in entertainment over time, 
as we can see in an analysis from Ghaznavi, Grosso, and Taylor 2017, who compared gender stereotypes, sexualization, and aggression of female characters between Hollywood and Bollywood films between 2004 and 2013 by analyzing representations of men and women in the promotional materials of the top 10 grossing films from both industries each year. Realism of characters is broken down into realistic, partially realistic, and unrealistic based on whether the main female characters portrayed lacked human qualities. Partially real characters were those that were human but engaged in unrealistic behavior, for example. The role that a female main character played in relationship to main male characters, be it romantic or otherwise, and the amount of screen time of the female characters were also assessed. Independent coders rated the female protagonist on her attractiveness as well as body type. Attire was broken down into four types. Demure, which described fully clothed, non-sexualized clothing. Suggestive, which described somewhat revealing clothing. Partially clad and fully nude. Sexual activities of the characters were also noted, including having sex, kissing, engaging in sexual talk, or being the object of another character's lust. Two types of aggression were assessed, relational or indirect aggression and physical aggression. Relational aggression includes behaviors such as social exclusion, malicious humor, yelling, or insults. Yes, we know. We know everything. Thanks. And you know nothing. It's a shame you're not a woman anymore. She'd have understood. While physical aggression is, well, fairly self-explanatory. You're going to give me your jacket, your helmet, and your motorcycle, and in return, I'm going to let you keep your hand. They found that time was significantly related to the realism of character depictions only in U.S. promotional material, with female characters becoming increasingly more fantastic and less grounded over time. However, in both Bali and Hollywood, the physical characteristics of female protagonists had changed very little, still largely being attractive women. Hindi female characters were more likely to be portrayed in sexually suggestive poses and with mostly sexually suggestive attire while U.S. female characters were depicted in a wider variety of costumes, ranging from demure to fully nude, but with fewer characters overall in the U.S. material having at least one major part of her body exposed compared to the Hindi material. Female protagonists were more likely to be involved with male characters romantically in Hindi films than in American ones, and over time, fewer female characters appeared in promotional material for romantic films in the American market, while becoming more common in fantasy and sci-fi films, bizarrely erasing women from the genre of film that women actually tend to prefer. Women were more likely to be featured in posters for Hollywood films than in Bollywood films, and over time the amount of screen time that female characters received in trailers increased significantly, but only in U.S. cinema. Female protagonists were about as equally aggressive in material from both backgrounds, and the scholars found an increase in aggressive attractive women in film over time, but particularly so in the Hindi sample. That is, over time, female protagonists have become more aggressive and less romantic, particularly in Western cinema, but the same trend is happening overseas as well. Despite this increasing propensity for strong, aggressive female protagonists, we've seen time and time again that, while well, sure, women report that they like this stuff in media at face value, when you dig even a little bit deeper, they don't seem to actually think that it's doing anything societally, and instead, all these messages seem to do is make women pay more attention to women's portrayal in the media. For me, those results beg the same question we've come across over and over. Are women just saying that they like this messaging because it's politically correct? Because that's how women think they're supposed to answer these kinds of questions? Women say that these ads and films and shows intended to empower them are empowering and hence like the messaging and the brands that create them. But are these messages actually empowering? And uh, it appears that's going to be a no-go as well, as we can see in a study from Court Debu, Dalsin, and Harrison 2022, who examined the effects of empowerment-themed advertisements on American women's speed of processing words related to objectification or empowerment. Now, I'm not a big fan of the implicit associations test. I've talked about it a lot, and I'm not a fan here either, which is essentially what was used in this experiment, as it is often applied to things like racism or sexism, because all these kinds of test measure is, as I said, speed of processing. Just because you react faster to the face of someone of your same race does not make you a racist. And instead, anyone being serious about the implicit associations test would admit it's probably just because if you're white, there's a pretty good chance that your parents are also white. 
However, my gripes with the IAT aside, it actually makes some sense to use in this instance. Specifically, the lexical decision task that was used in this experiment displayed words associated with objectification, empowerment, or were neutral, as well as non-words, and measured the expediency at which respondents identified the word as an actual word or as nonsense. The hypothesis then is that women who recognize empowerment words more quickly than objectifying words are thinking more about women's empowerment. Participants also were asked directly if they felt empowered while watching the advertisement and if the ads made her feel aware of her physical appearance. I think we look hot. Totally hot. Ugly bitches. Four types of ads were shown. General traditional ads, which did not feature empowering messaging, nor focused on beauty. General beauty ads, which did not feature empowering messaging, but did focus on women's physical appearance. General empowerment themed ads, which featured an empowerment message, but did not emphasize women's looks and beauty empowerment ads, which came specifically from companies related to beauty products, such as CoverGirl and Pantene, but did not reference or focus on women's appearance outside of referencing supposed beauty double standards. Maybe she's born with it. Maybe, <laughs> Maybe it's, it's clinical depression. <laughs> Women reported that they felt more empowered when watching either the general empowerment ad or the beauty empowerment ad compared to the ads without an empowerment message to about the same degree. Body self-awareness was highest after watching the traditional beauty ad, followed by the empowered beauty ad, then the empowered general ad, and finally, the general traditional ad. That is, women were more likely to be self-conscious about her body when media was designed specifically to empower her compared to a neutral ad with no objectification nor empowerment message. If the true goal of these messages in media is to make women feel good about themselves, then interestingly, Girl power messages are more likely to make women feel self-conscious about their own bodies than no messaging whatsoever. Also of interest is the responses to the word lexical decision task, which indicate that objectifying and empowering ads really didn't have the effect that the authors anticipated. Specifically, women identified both empowerment and objectifying words at about the same speeds regardless of condition. While both objectifying and empowerment words were identified less quickly after watching the traditional beauty advertisement than any other ad type, and produced decreased response times even when compared to subjects who were not exposed to any ad across all conditions, women reacted to both types of words, objectifying and empowering, more expediently than neutral words. The ad that produced the fastest reactions to empowerment words was actually the traditional generalized ad not the ones that included empowerment messaging. The very presence of empowerment messaging inhibits processing of the empowerment message. The messaging is an active detriment to performance. These ads, films, and shows aren't activating empowerment schema in women. The only thing that they empower are the egos of the media and Hollywood executives. We can see then once more that while women may say they'd like female empowerment girl power, girl boss messages in media, they don't actually seem to. And perhaps more importantly, it doesn't make them feel more cognizant of empowerment messaging relative to objectifying messaging, regardless of pretty much any kind of media framing in which they are exposed to it. If anything, it's the opposite. If the purpose of all of these movies and television shows and ads and comic books, etc., is to make women feel empowered, well, they at least aren't thinking more about empowering language after being exposed to such content, and thus once again evidencing that all this pandering is pointless, if not actively doing the opposite of what it is intended to do. So if no one, including women, seem to be particularly fond of rude, obnoxious, masculine girl bosses, even if we often enjoy a strong, attractive woman in action media, why is the other catchphrase we so commonly hear not just that women need to see themselves in these movies that do anything but entertain them, but also that the only people who dislike these movies and shows and comics are just misogynists? Of course, the data don't support that hypothesis, but let's take a closer look at that very specific genre that has suffered most significantly in recent years from running with that contention, one that is unsupported by the science, and that is the action genre specifically superheroes, and how people really feel about female representation in their superhero, fantasy, and sci-fi franchises. The 
internet is frequently blamed as the ultimate source of all anti-female protagonist misogyny, responsible for the failures of women-led productions like the Marvels, She-Hulk, Velma, Rings of Power, etc. But just how vitriolic is it really? Winbear and Narn 2021 assessed just over 4,000 Reddit comments regarding users' reactions to the announcement that Natalie Portman would assume the role of Thor in the then-upcoming film Thor Love and Thunder, via thematic analysis. Well, how do you think that turned out? If only you knew how bad things really are. Thematic analysis is a qualitative method that allows scholars to track trends and themes within portions of text by taking a small sample of said text, in this instance Reddit comments, and developing a codebook with which other messages with similar themes can be identified. While it might sound like a bunch of commie gobbledygook, and while I do obviously prefer quantitative methods, thematic analysis is still useful for isolating sentiments in large samples of messages due to the streamlining and operationalizing that that codebook provides for use in data analysis software. The authors found seven distinct themes used in Reddit comments, the first being issues of representation, speculating that Portman had only returned because her character was being made into a powerful goddess, rather than Thor's love interest and a character that many users described as boring. It is interesting that the Redditors largely seemed to agree that Portman's character was uninteresting, yet still wanted her back specifically because they claimed they would enjoy seeing that same boring character get a larger and more prominent role with a female director. At that point, Patty Jenkins, though Jenkins of course would later be replaced with Taika Waititi. Regardless of who ended up directing it, as we've discussed before, people can be prone to saying that they like something in media for socially acceptable or political reasons, while their brain's reaction to that stimuli betrays their true apathy, which was reflected in the audience ratings for Thor Love and Thunder, which, while a financial success, received middling reviews from both audiences and critics alike. The Redditors were, astonishingly, not an entire hive mind, as many didn't bother with virtue signaling about the importance of female representation in a superhero franchise, which has always featured female characters that audiences did like, such as Pepper Potts and Black Widow. The second theme identified was talk of money, with many posters speculating that Portman's return was purely financial, as she had previously said that she was done with the MCU, with users coming up with different insulting names to levy at her, such as whore and thought. Hey, I resemble that latter remark. <laughs> the third theme was one that I personally brought up when Portman's role in Love and Thunder was announced, which was the issue of names versus titles. In superhero comics, but particularly in DC more so than Marvel, there are plenty of characters who have assumed the title of a particular hero despite being completely different people. For example, Green Lantern is a title that many individuals have held over the years both alien and representatives of Earth's cosmic zip code 2813, because the Green Lantern Corps is a galaxy-spanning loose organization of space police with a diverse cast of aliens, elevated animals, and… Black people! <laughs> For Hal Jordan or Jon Stewart or Kyle Rayner to call themselves Green Lantern is little different than someone identifying themselves as this. FBI, open up! In contrast, Thor is not a title, it's the guy's name. Technically, any native-born American over the age of 35 can become president of the nation, but president is a title. Assuming the role of commander-in-chief doesn't mean you also can call yourself Joe Biden. Although I'm not sure why anyone would want to. And, and Joan, Shingang, I'm going to pronounce for Shanga, Redditors were not all in agreement that this was an issue which is unsurprising as these are the same people who started naming their kids Khaleesi. Some argued that Portman's character should have a different title, such as Goddess of Thunder, others that making her a copy of Thor but female was itself devaluing to women, and still others took umbrage with what they described as appropriation or degradation of Norse mythology and pagan beliefs. Although, I mean, that ship had kind of already sailed. Look, I liked Idris Elba as Heimdall, but if you want to be accurate to Norse mythology, it's kind of a weird casting choice for a figure described as the whitest of all of the gods. Theme 4 concerned physicality, namely that Chris Hemsworth is a buff, giant man and Natalie Portman is a petite, lithe woman, even by industry standards, being about as two-dimensional as her character, and which makes it difficult to imagine her being able to possibly be as physically strong as her male counterpart. Posters were not entirely averse to the idea of an actress assuming the role of Thor, as previously mentioned. 
but many did suggest a taller actress should play such a role, with several suggesting Gwendolyn Christie, who played Brienne of Tarth in Game of Thrones. Still other editors were unconcerned with how muscular or tall Portman was, but rather just posted about her boobs. Small minds concerned with small things, I suppose. The Redditor's fifth theme within the discussion was concerned with the issue of a woman taking over the role of a man, with several noting that the inscription on Thor's hammer reads that, quote, "...whosoever holds this hammer, if he be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor." And others besides Thor himself have been able to use the hammer in the past, yet that still has never made any of those characters become Thor himself. Again, that's his name, it's not a title. It's not that fans are averse to someone else using Thor's hammer or having a similar weapon, as several users mentioned Beta Ray Bill, an alien horseman who was able to lift the hammer himself. Outside of the comic books, though, there was no major backlash to Captain America clearly indicating that he was capable of at least moving the hammer in Age of Ultron, let alone him outright wielding it in Endgame. If anything, the scene in Age of Ultron where Cap budges Thor's hammer is perhaps a fan favorite with great payoff. Just listen to people losing their minds over it in the theater. <laughs> Obviously, the authors of this piece believe that all of this is because of sexism, and not because there is nothing about Natalie Portman's character of Jane Foster that had ever been shown on screen or set up of showing her as being worthy of lifting the hammer in the way that Captain America was explicitly. Convenient for their worldview, though, to see things that way. Commenters also felt that the inclusion of Portman as the new Thor was part of what was seemingly an ongoing trend in Marvel films of replacing or even outright denigrating their male characters, something that would only continue to be confirmed, given that Thor's character arc in Endgame largely revolved around him becoming an overweight, lazy drunk, and thus anticipated more of the same from Love and Thunder. Oh, if only you knew how bad things were gonna get, 2019 Redditors. The fact that you don't know tells me all I need to know about this new, rather old Nick Fury. No matter how hard you fight for what's right, there's always someone stronger to undermine you. <laughs> He's already dead! Curiously, the authors note that many posters reported that the MCU was becoming, well, the MCU, although I don't think that Nerd Roddick had quite yet coined that term. With male characters becoming displaced in favor of the female characters, with the authors countering the claim of the Redditors by noting that, as of the time of their writing, there was only one female-led film in the franchise, Captain Marvel, and thus all of this concern was unfounded. Well, just how unfounded did that fear turn out to be? Almost like it wasn't unfounded at all, and for once, Reddit was right about something. The sixth theme concerned the role of director Taika Waititi, with many Reddit users praising his work on the previous Thor film, Ragnarok, and insisting that he would ensure that Portman's role would be well handled. Again, we of course know how that all turned out, but the authors of the article also perceived that response in and of itself as sexist, because such sentiments placed more responsibility on the quality of a film on its director rather than on its leading actress. Which isn't sexist, that's how movies work. Hilariously, they describe Watiti as having, quote, some authority over the project. Yeah, the director has some authority. Well, I certainly would hope so. By that logic, if the actress matters more than the director, then are the Star Wars prequels also Natalie Portman's fault? Master, she's just being overdramatic. Honestly, I've choked her much harder during foreplay in the bedroom. The final theme was profitability, with Redditors discussing that comic book films simply appeal to a male audience over a female one, and that it could be risky financially to make a superhero film focused on a female character. While at the time, sure, the one female-led film out of the MCU, Captain Marvel had seemingly proved that concern misplaced, making over a billion dollars at the box office. Again, hindsight is 2020. As the closing box office of that film sequel, the Marvels came in at just 200 million globally, making less than half of its own production and advertisement costs, if we are being polite. So again, it seems that the Redditors were right on that one as well. The Marvels promoted itself to a female audience with its cats and girl power messaging, and yet women didn't show up to watch it. Again, what women say they want in terms of media doesn't appear to be what they actually enjoy, or at least will pay 
to go watch in cinemas. The sales of action figures and comics were also brought up in the discussion, with posters noting that these sales of female characters in action films had performed rather horribly. For example, there were so many excess Rose Tico figures that Target began practically giving them away. Hell, people probably bought more intact, headless LeBron James Space Jam 2 figures than they did intact Rose Ticos. The authors argue that while sales of Thor comics were down, that comic sales were down across the board. Gee, can't imagine why. And thus, the slump was not indicative of anything particular to Thor or to Jane Foster as Thor. And yeah, they are right in that sense. But it's not because of people moving to digital comics or because of the pandemic. It's because the comic books suck. Comic book shops all over the US aren't struggling to keep their doors open because everyone just prefers manga all of a sudden for absolutely no reason. No, we don't care what you would do if you were Iron Man. We don't care who you are. You're writing Tony Stark. You're not writing yourself in a book. If that's the case, write your own comic with you in it. No one will read it because nobody cares. It's because Marvel and DC prioritize politic over writing and have allowed so many people within their companies to fail upwards that fans know there is no reason to be invested financially or otherwise in modern big two comic books, because it's not about being entertaining. It's not about writing a good story. It's about selling a political message. Against my better judgment, I do want to bring up a paper that was published in a scholarly journal regarding the representation of women in Marvel movies from Alofadipe and Akezabal, 2021. And woo, what a couple of names. I said I'm mentioning this against my better judgment because, well, I've honestly never come across a paper like this published in an academic journal before. And that's because the lead author was at the time a high school student who co-authored this with her teacher. So we're just going to read what they presented here and not judge too much because never in all of my years of reading research have I ever come across a paper published ostensibly by a child. Although, honestly, this paper is more coherent and has more actual information in it than any critical cultural feminist scholarship I've ever read. So that in and of itself is perhaps quite impressive. The authors examined six female characters and their various appearances in the MCU. Pepper Potts, Black Widow, Scarlet Witch, Gamora, Captain Marvel, and Nebula, according to Screen Time. And astonishingly, found that most of the female characters had less time on screen over time as the film franchise marched on. Well, proof of sexism for sure. For example, Pepper Potts appeared for 23 minutes in the first Iron Man film, but only for four in Endgame. Black Widow had nearly 25 minutes in Avengers, but 16 in Endgame. Scarlet Witch, 12 in Age of Ultron, but two in Endgame. And Gamora, 31 in Guardians, but just under five in Endgame. The only female character assessed who gained more screen time between films was Nebula, who went from four and a half minutes in Guardians to 16 in Endgame, which uh, wouldn't have anything to do with her being the adopted daughter of Endgame's antagonist, but whatever. Perhaps most perplexingly to the authors, I'm sure, and what I'm sure will also shock you as well, dear viewer, is the amount of time that Brie Larson spent on screen as Captain Marvel in her eponymous film, Captain Marvel, which was an hour and five minutes. Yet by Endgame, she only got six minutes of screen time and oh, what an excellent and beloved six minutes of cinema that truly was. While the authors of this piece conclude that the decreased screen time is somehow evidence of superheroine erasure in the MCU, obviously the real reason for said decrease is that Infinity War and Endgame were massive ensemble films that didn't really have time to focus on any single character in the way that standalone films do. Alufadipe and Akezabal actually go a step farther in their interpretation of what these graphs mean, stating that the MCU's, quote, efforts to disguise tokenism as female inclusivity by including all female fight scenes were over-dramatized and insufficient in an attempt to make up for years of female marginalization. Once again, evidencing that there really is no pleasing people who think this way. Put more female superheroes in your movies? Well, that's tokenism. Have a drawn out all female fight scene? That's a paltry attempt at making up for years of marginalization. What we keep seeing in the data, we also see here in the sentiments of these authors. They say they want strong female characters, but they don't seem to like it when they get it. 
most amusingly to me is that the authors end their paper by stating that they believed Marvel was finally, quote, taking a step in the right direction with the announcement of Black Widow, WandaVision, Miss Marvel, Agent Carter, She-Hulk, and Captain Marvel 2, the latter of which would, of course, become the Marvels. Well, I sure hope you liked the representation as much as the audiences did, Olufidipe and Akezabal. Monkey's paw sure slammed shut on that one now, didn't it? But as I said, while that study may give us an interesting look into even the minds of ostensibly academic women or girls, into how they feel about superheroine representation, it's almost identical to what we've seen in the data from the total female population. That is, while women will say that they like or want one thing, it doesn't seem that they actually do, and rather than consider why it is that she doesn't like a thing, she instead just demands more female representation, more girl bosses, only to be perpetually unhappy with the outcomes of her own demands. Well, I really don't be like that sometimes. Shit's wack. Continuing our look specifically into superheroes, as that does tend to be the focus of much of the girl boss media in the last couple of years, Shuai 2023 examined female audiences' perceptions of these characters in film in a sample of British and Chinese women. Shuai found that British women and all but two Chinese women liked Wonder Woman, and a majority either disliked Catwoman or had not seen the film. Don't ask me why they used Catwoman, which is widely regarded as one of the worst films ever made, and not instead Captain Marvel, which, whatever you think of Brie Larson, was a box office hit and contemporary with Wonder Woman. I mean, Catwoman came out in 2004. There are probably more Chinese people who know what happened in Tiananmen Square than who have watched Catwoman, but I digress. Tiananmen is a country. Tiananmen Square Massacre. Free Tibet. Dalai Lama. While 35 of the 40 British participants described herself as a feminist, only three of the Chinese participants described herself as a feminist. Of the five British women who did not define herself as a feminist, all were between the ages of 18 and 24, and none had completed a degree in higher education, with several describing the term as outdated or associated with lesbianism. I'll hail Stephen King! What? Huh? Huh? Of the lesbians! Despite several of them saying that they believed in gender equality, indicating perhaps that younger women are becoming increasingly disinterested in feminism as a political movement, within media or without. Perhaps considering the rates of domestic abuse amongst lesbian couples, though, they were particularly averse to that label, preferring instead to hook up with someone from the Metropolitan Police, as at least then the pay would be better. Better have paid your TV uh, license, sir! Well, no, I haven't, but, uh, I... and Crumpy! No, I'm not... No, 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 no. The predominant sentiment among Chinese women was that feminists caused social trouble in a rare Chinese dub, and of the three that identified themselves as feminists, contrary to the British sample in which only women over the age of 24 called themselves feminists, the Chinese feminist women were all under the age of 24, single, and pursuing postgraduate degrees. Both Chinese and British feminists mentioned the Me Too movement, but interestingly, several Chinese women said that the importance of the Me Too movement was because women in Britain and America do not have equal rights to men, the way that they said existed in China, and instead identified as feminists as a way of attempting to help Western women in their fight against inequity. Which I guess is true that men and women are equal in China because neither have any rights. Here you are all equally worthless. Both feminists and non-feminist Brits said that they enjoyed seeing Wonder Woman being self-reliant and not require the assistance of a man. In contrast, Chinese women did not respond differently to Wonder Woman in comparison to a male superhero, not viewing the film as particularly feminist in the way that British women did. It seems that women generally liked Wonder Woman regardless of culture or personal feminist ideology. Thus, if Hollywood is to remain insistent on its focus on female superheroes, these data are indicative that Wonder Woman should be the model, as no other film or television show mentioned, including Elektra, Catwoman, and Supergirl, produced the same positive responses as Wonder Woman did in these respondents. While Wonder Woman was a critical success, and seems to have been a film that women enjoyed regardless of their feminist identity, Captain Marvel was also a critical success, and yet was met with much more scrutiny. Now, anyone not being silly knows that likely the reason that Captain Marvel performed as well as it did at the box office is because it was sold to audiences as a necessary piece of media that would need be consumed in order to understand the events of Endgame, and was positioned in between the cliffhanger of Infinity War, when excitement, hype, and tension in the MCU was at an all-time high. So yeah, of course it made a billion dollars. 
but did it because it was good or because it was marketed as being necessary to keep up with the meta-narrative? Did anyone actually like it? Even women? Even feminists? How long will you play Captain Marvel for? I don't know. I don't know. Does anyone want me to do it again? No. Or was it all just artificial because everybody was only actually interested in Endgame? Let's not speculate. Let's look at some data. Fimbianti 2020 examined IMDb reviews of Captain Marvel and immediately found that fewer reviewers who did disclose their gender reviewed Captain Marvel than did those who reviewed Wonder Woman. 19% women reviewing Captain Marvel versus 24.4% women who reviewed Wonder Woman. This alone is a telling finding because it illustrates just how few women are interested in these films with female protagonists when those films are in the action or superhero genre in the first place. However, because this is a piece of feminist scholarship, she spends much of the rest of her article just being mad that users didn't like Captain Marvel as much as they liked Wonder Woman. Rather hilariously, she cites Wonder Woman creator William Moulton Marston as an apex feminist, without seemingly any awareness that Marston was most likely not so much a feminist, but rather a fetishist who either wanted to tie women up or wanted a strong muscle woman to tie him up and bully him. To this day, the debate wages on about which side of the BDSM anti-wife equation that Marston was actually on. But go off, Fimbianti, and tell me about how empowering this scene is. Except in typical feminist scholarship fashion, she goes on to just complain about how Wonder Woman is subject to the male gaze. Look what the homosexuals have done to me. You can't just calm that out and reset it? Only to then go on to lament how reviews of Captain Marvel included users describing Brie Larson as, quote, a very unlikable person because, quote, she hates men and just wanted to spout feminist hate. Well, I don't know what would have given any audience members that impression. Am I saying that I hate white dudes? No, I'm not. The rest of the article is mostly just rambling that I won't continue to waste any of your time on, dear viewer. We've wasted enough today already. But the important part is that even women left more reviews on Wonder Woman than they did on Captain Marvel. Once again, evidencing that no matter what they say on social media, nor even in academic articles, women were more interested in a less political movie starring a beautiful and feminine, if physically strong heroine like Wonder Woman, more than a film with a violent, masculine, and unlikable heroine like Captain Marvel, played by a really unlikable actress. Another film that gained wide criticism for its depiction of a strong female protagonist was Disney's live-action remake of Mulan, in which the previously normal human woman was bestowed with inhuman magical powers, combat prowess, and the secret knowledge of moral relativism as it concerns the treatment of Uyghur Muslims. And the reaction to which was studied by Pratiwi and Prima Sita, 2022, using a sample of 204 tweets posted between the 7th and the 27th of September, 2020. A total of 19 responses celebrated the movie for its representation of women's empowerment and believed that the film taught women to, quote, be able to live in their power. Eight respondents appreciated the empowerment messaging, but believed that said messaging was too forced. In stark opposition, 177 tweets were expressly negative towards the new portrayal of Mulan, with 20 comparing her new powers to that of other heroines, eight who noted that said new powers undermined the importance of the original character, six who said the superpower made her original character seem inferior to men, nine who said that she lacked character development, 27 who said that they could not suspend their disbelief for the introduction of the magical chi element, and overwhelmingly 108 who believed that the Mulan character was supposed to be one who uses her brain, not her brawn, nor some form of innate magical power to overcome obstacles completely going against the original film's messaging and illustrating once again that women and men don't actually seem to like this stuff. We constantly hear that these films are good for women in some way though, so regardless of whether or not women actually like them, is female representation in superhero media in any way positive for women viewers? Single Sumter and Jansen 2020 exposed Dutch adolescents between the ages of 16 and 18 to an episode of Supergirl wherein she either used physical strength or charisma to produce a pro-social outcome, stopping a villain from achieving whatever their evil machinations may be. Subjects' English language proficiency, as the episode was played in English, experience with superhero content, intentions to behave pro-socially and compassionately in the future, intentions to defend others in social situations in the future, feelings of general hostility and aggravation, as well as identification with the Supergirl character were all measured. 
after watching the episode, men were more likely to express pro-sociality and defending behaviors, while there was no effect on women's pro-sociality and defending intuitions in either condition. However, in the violent condition, where Supergirl used violence to resolve a conflict, men reported particularly elevated pro-social intentions. Again, there was no effect on women as it concerned pro-sociality in either violent or non-violent condition. Men were seemingly inspired in either condition, but women by neither. There was no effect of exposure to either the violent nor the non-violent Supergirl episode on feelings of hostility in either sex. Finally, identification with the character was unrelated to any of the variables assessed, meaning that women were totally unaffected by a violent or non-violent female character as it influenced her own intentions towards benevolence, and identification with that female character also played no role in men's increased pro-sociality and defense motivations, which they experienced as a result of watching Supergirl being violent or being diplomatic to solve problems. That is, women don't really seem to be at all influenced by the actions of female superheroes as it concerns engaging in good actions by her own volition. While men may be more likely to at least intend to behave in a pro-social manner towards others and defend others after having seen any representation of a female hero, be she violent or non-violent. Further, I find it important to note the lack of relevance that character identification played here. It didn't matter if the woman saw herself in Supergirl or not. There was no effect of that character's actions that influenced women's own intentions to be pro-social or defensive of the weak. So no, it doesn't seem that these films or shows do anything at all for women, besides keep Brie Larson away from working as a barista and spitting in your coffee out of pure spite because you're, well, a 40-year-old white dude. To round out this discussion, I want to briefly mention a study from Pinnell and Ben Morowitz 2015, because frankly, I think Dr. Ben Morowitz is a hack fraud. And every single time I come across a study from her, I am met with a new litany of seemingly either intentional methodological errors made with the express purpose of proving some feminist point, or a misrepresentation of her own data in her abstracts as to inaccurately portray what she really found. Going all the way back to her doctoral dissertation, and this is just another one of them. But let me begin by explaining the study and its findings. Female university students were exposed to a 13-minute montage of scenes taken from the Spider-Man or X-Men films. The authors do not specify which scenes were included in these montages, only that Spider-Man featured a female character, presumably Mary Jane, as a sexualized victim, and X-Men featured a character, I have no idea whom because this is a Ben Morowitz paper, but I presume probably Mystique, who was a sexualized heroine. A control group of women watched no montage and all participants were surveyed regarding gender stereotyping, which includes questions such as, quote, a woman's children should come before her career, and, quote, women should share housework equally, as well as body self-esteem and self-objectification, which requires subjects to rate different body attributes in order of importance to her own personal self-concept. About 20% of women across all conditions said that action films were her favorite genre, and only 13% said that superhero films in particular were her favorite genre indicating at step one, as I keep saying, that these movies really aren't the kind of things that most women tend to enjoy. Viewing clips of the sexualized victim was related to less egalitarian beliefs about women's role in society, but there was no effect on gender stereotyping after watching the clips featuring the sexualized heroine. The effect of either condition was significant only when the alpha level was set at P equals 0 0.10, which is to say, not statistically significant as statistical significance should always be set at P is less than 0.05, but they reported that as marginally significant anyway. Are you starting to see why I'm not so fond of this author? Participants did indicate lowered self-esteem when watching the sexualized heroine compared to the control group, but no such effect was present when participants viewed the sexualized victim compared to the control. To reiterate, viewers felt worse about their own bodies when watching a sexy, strong female heroine compared to when watching a sexy, weak female victim in a superhero film. There was no effect of either film on reports of the importance of appearance on personal self-concept. Subjects who watched either the sexy heroine or the sexy victim did not place greater emphasis on the importance of body competence, which includes notions such as physical strength and health, compared to the control. There was no significant difference in reported enjoyment nor entertainment between the two montages in women nor in men. It's also important to note that not only do we not have any clue what scenes were chosen for the stimulus here, 
but we also don't know how they were edited together. Normally, I actually wouldn't be so skeptical, but I'm familiar with this author's work, and she has a long history of being somewhat disingenuous, to put it mildly, in order to prove her point. In her doctoral dissertation, for example, she compared player self-efficacy, that is, how much did a player believe that he or she was able to complete gameplay goals based on the sexualization of the character that she was playing using two levels from Tomb Raider, one of which featured Laura Croft's typical adventuring attire, and the other from after she had infiltrated a fancy dinner party and was wearing a cocktail dress. She found that female players said that they felt less efficacious when playing the more sexualized Laura, but Dr. Ben Morowitz failed to ever mention that in said level, Laura isn't just wearing a cocktail dress, she's also taken off her heels and is wearing no shoes. Gee, Liz, do you think that maybe context appropriateness of the attire when doing acrobatics might have been just a little bit part of the reason why women felt that Laura wasn't dressed for the job? Who do you think she is? Bilbo Baggins? Similarly then, it's important to point out that whatever scenes were included in these montages inherently would not be fully representative of either character, but rather likely only the most sexualized scenes that also emphasize the character's strengths or weaknesses. But again, I can only guess about that because the authors conveniently didn't elaborate. In summation, well, if one were to just read the abstract of this article, they may believe that the findings indicated that women hated their bodies and became more sexist against women after watching a sexy female heroine or a female victim in a superhero film. But that's not what was actually displayed in the data. The only real effects that are of any interest are in opposition to how the authors attempt desperately to frame them. That is, while yes, viewers possessed fewer traditional gender role beliefs when they watched a montage of a sexualized female victim compared to a sexualized female heroine in a superhero film, the only condition that produced any other effect was a negative one for the sexy and strong heroine upon viewer self-esteem. Seeing a sexy female victim had no effect on self-esteem, positive nor negative. That is, a sexy heroine reduces self-esteem, while a sexy victim has no effect on self-esteem in superhero films on women. Those were the only two findings. And yet if one were to again just read the abstract, you would think that any representation of sexy women in superhero films was deleterious to women in some fashion. This is why I cannot stand the work of Dr. Elizabeth Ben Morowitz. I wrote my dissertation to debunk her dissertation, and here I am years later, still coming across research from her that I am seemingly forced to debunk, both in methods and in presentation of her data. She is truly my nemesis, as cringy as it is to say. A righteous infliction of retribution manifested by an appropriate agent. Perhaps calling her my white whale is a bit more appropriate. In academia, of course. But with all of that in mind, let's discuss the implications of everything that we've looked at in this video and come to a few conclusions. Today, we examined several of the most common myths in modern Hollywood that women are underrepresented in action media, and that when they are represented, it's only as babes or damsels in distress, which drives women away from said media, that women instead want to see media with strong, aggressive female protagonists, and that the lack of such representation is another reason why women seem to stick to dramas and romances rather than the action genres, and that the thing that's really been holding superhero films back from being even a bigger cultural phenomenon than they have been up until quite recently is a lack of women in these roles. We saw scientifically that none of these hypotheses are backed up by data, and in fact, in most cases, the opposite was true. Women like to see attractive females in movies and films and advertisements, and seeing such women does not harm her own self-esteem. In contrast, women do not like to see particularly masculine women in these roles and actually tend to prefer feminine characters be, well, feminine even as victims rather than as heroes inherently. Additionally, women just generally aren't very interested in action or superhero films, and no amount of screen time or displays of being superior to her male counterpart does anything to change that. If anything, it only makes women less interested in the genre. Natalie Portman may have been a plank of wood damsel in distress in the first Thor movie, but I would bet money, based on these data, that the average woman would be more likely to enjoy that film than Captain Marvel, not only for the Chris Hemsworth eye candy, but because Natalie Portman's character isn't an aggressive, violent cow 
but instead a physically weak but attractive woman in need of saving by a handsome hero. Why do you think that Twilight was so immensely popular with women? Bella is the antithesis of a girl boss. She exists only to be saved by her competing supernatural boyfriends, while the female audience inserts themselves into her otherwise featureless, uninteresting corpse. In summation, every single major choice that Hollywood production companies have made in recent years to remove feminine, compassionate, kind, nurturing, beautiful, and even sexy women from their films and television programs, only to replace those roles with loud, rude, aggressive, violent, masculine, and often unattractive characters in an attempt to finally reach gender parity at the box office for action blockbusters, has failed because no matter what college-educated women say that they want out of their media, that's not what they actually want in practice. And up until recently, that was okay. Why do women have to like watching people punch each other up in space rather than two people falling in love? Clearly, you can lie to yourself and you can lie to people on the internet all you like, ladies. But numbers… numbers don't lie. And with almost every Disney release of 2023 going down in flames, the numbers are pretty clear. No amount of female representation is going to get women to go see action movies or superhero films the way that men will. And it gets worse than that, as this push for the girl boss that these companies are so convinced exists somewhere out there in the ether, and yet cannot be identified scientifically because, spoiler alert, it's not real, has now also affected movies and shows that women typically would show up to see, such as The Little Mermaid, Mulan, or Wish, precisely because the female protagonists have been made either aggressive, unattractive, masculine, or a combination of all three, and almost exclusively while excising romance from the stories. In other words, all of the things that women dislike in their entertainment is now being aimed at women. If you're at all surprised that these media giants blowing billions on these projects are seemingly incapable of doing the kind of research on extant data that I was able to do here in a fruitless pursuit of some imaginary diverse female audience, well, it's because it's not actually about making movies for women or girls to empower them. It's about politics, and politics alone. And when all you care about is politics, science and data don't enter into the equation because it's an equation where 2 plus 2 equals 5, or in this case, 2 plus 2 equals billions of dollars lost. It's easy for journalists, actors, directors, and executives to chalk up all of their recent failures to racist, misogynist media critics on YouTube, as they have been doing for years with the fandom menace. But I hope in this video I will have been able to provide a perhaps much-needed scientific backing to what the critics that either aren't ideologically driven or paid off have been saying for years. No one actually likes this trash, but seemingly most ironically of all, the exact target demographic, women don't like it. If there was any interest in honesty and truth rather than politics, every company in Hollywood would be well aware of every single study that I've discussed here today, and yet they continue to trip all over themselves as if oblivious. I would say, hey, hire me, Disney. I'll conduct some real research on what audiences want to watch, including that elusive audience of neurodivergent queer BIPOC. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. A new diktat has just been issued. BIPOC is out as it centers whiteness. The new correct term is BBIA, gender fluid folks that they seem so desperate to court. And pro tip for free, those people only exist on Twitter and can't put their phones down long enough to watch a TV show, let alone go to a cinema. But even if they offered me a position at this point, I think I'd have to pass, because it looks like that entire ship is sinking, and I, for one, am no longer sad to see it go. When the Society for Magical, am I even allowed to say the title of this movie, is a real thing, you know that absolutely no one is doing any research on who wants to watch what. But again, even if they offered me a job, I'd have to pass after what I've seen recently. Yes, we know. We know everything. Thanks. And you know nothing. It's a shame you're not a woman anymore. She'd have understood. Yeah, this was it. This was the final straw. Y you finally broke me. Congratulations. Congratulations! 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 These films and shows aren't just insulting to the white male fans that the creatives actively seek out to offend, they're insulting to me. Presumably, part of the elusive audience of overly educated, kind of gay women that they so want to watch their crap. Because I love comic books. I love action and science fiction and fantasy media. 
I love these characters that they bastardize. Hell, I'm probably the only person on Earth besides David Mack himself who would say that she loves the character Echo. And yet, despite being part of the target audience that they are so desperately seeking, none of this is made for me. And that's because it's not made for anyone. It's not about art. It's not about entertainment. It's about politics. Hey, what do you guys think? Do you think women actually don't like seeing hot female characters on the screen, or is it something that everyone, regardless of sex, can enjoy? Why is it that women don't appear to sincerely appreciate these aggressive female characters in media? Is it internalized misogyny? Or is it just because said characters are unappealing and kind of bitchy? Will putting more female characters into action in sci-fi media eventually get women to watch? Does anyone in Hollywood actually care about getting women involved in these hobbies? Or is it all really just politics? Let me know what you think in the comments down below because I genuinely am curious, but also because it really helps get this video into the YouTube algorithm so more people can see it. If you liked the video, give it a like and subscribe if you're not already subscribed for more content related to social science, pop culture, and politics. If you really liked what you saw, you can support my work on Patreon or Subscribestar, or by buying some merch from my merch store, all linked down below in the description. If you sign up for Patreon or Subscribestar, you'll get access to my Discord where I screen all of these videos before they go live so we can watch them together and just hang out and, you know, join our little social science community. You will also see your name listed at the end of every video, along with these fine folks here. If you want to see more from me, I do a weekly news and politics podcast with my co-host Spoon, aka The Aristocratic Utensil, every Wednesday at 8.30pm GMT, 3.30pm EST, as well as a Pathfinder role-playing game on Tuesdays at 9pm GMT, 4pm EST, both over on the Broken Crown channel. I also play a 5th edition game with some names that you may be familiar with if you sat through this whole thing, X-Ray Girl, Comics Division, Epic Might, Disbrew, and DM'd by Eridai every Thursday on Geeks and Gamers Tabletop, so check me out there as well. Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, dear friends, Altana Volt. Girl would be a wallflower when the brotherhood's trying to take your mind power.